are you all? Thank you for joining today. Hello. Hi, Luis. Good to see you. Thank you. Same. Hey. Oh, Luis is here. That's nice. Scott, I know, and everyone else I don't know, which is great. It's better not to know anybody. Hey, Scott. Hey, Juliana. Norbert, Elder, Prisha. Thank you for joining. Nice to meet you too, Juliana. Yeah, um, my, my name is Ryan Desen. I'm a co-founder of Coding Nomads. I'm here today with Gilad Gressel. Gilad is a long-term mentor, course author, contributor, and, uh, and, and friend of Coding Nomads. And it's, it's late where Gilad is. Gilad, what time is it there for you now? It's uh, just 10.30, not too okay. late. Not too late. And today, Galad is going to be essentially showing us how to work with tabular data, kind of introducing some data analysis with Python and I believe pandas. Um, and so yes. I will uh, let, you, let you take it away, Galad. Um, okay. If anybody has any questions uh, as we're going along, you can raise your hand. You can also um, send them here in the chat on the side of the Zoom, and we will either answer them as they come up or, or answer them towards the end. Typically, we'll chat for a little while, and then we'll have an open Q&A afterwards where we can continue the discussion. So with that, I'll give it to you, Galad, and uh, thank you so thanks. much for being here with us. Okay, so uh, thanks all for joining. Um, I hope I will... Uh... I hope this will be informative. So my, you know, I'm a teacher by day and night <laughs> in the sense that I work at a university and I teach, um, I teach this stuff. I teach this all the time. And I really prefer these kinds, especially that I find, I think this is a pretty informal setting. Um, this, we're just friends here. So I would really prefer if people would ask um, as many questions as possible, more questions is better interrupt me. I don't have an agenda here. I'm not like trying to teach you something that you have to learn by the end of it. This library is an ocean. I definitely don't know everything there is to know about it. Um, so there's no way I can like teach you. There's no, I don't have like an end goal in sight. My goal is to get you excited about uh, this library, about doing some data analysis in Python. And the best way to do that is to make sure that you're engaged in understanding what I'm doing. So please stop me at any point, interrupt, ask questions, and we'll just go wherever it goes. I have prepared a whole bunch of stuff, hopefully too much that I can't get through. So that way, um, if nobody asks me any questions, at least I'll talk about something, <laughs> okay? So first of all, what is Pandas? Um, so with that, I'll just start now. So first thing is, what is Pandas? Um, Pandas is a high level programming library that supports data analysis and exploration on structured tabular data. So it's great for any kind of data that would fit in a table. And if you've never seen it before, you can just, you know, pandas uh, Python, you can Google it and it's, don't go there, go to, go to pandas.org, I think, I guess they're here. This is their documentation, but they have a nice website and um, they were started, it was started by, oh, I don't know where the actual main website is, but it was started by um, a financial guy named Wes McKinney. And basically he was using Python to crunch numbers and he, there wasn't you know, a great library for this. And so he basically wrote it. And now there's a whole, it's a big thing now. And it, so it does have a lot of financial support. It's really good at doing moving windows and averages and forward fill, back fill, and a lot of stuff that you would want for um, time series analysis with financial data. So it has that niche in there, but it has grown way beyond that financial thing. And it's gone into basically kind of the de facto thing that you use when you're dealing with a table in Python. So when you hear table, the first thing you should wonder is, oh, why aren't we using SQL then or SQL? And um, so I wrote the answer up here on the on the on the wall for you. But the answer is basically uh, you you. It's not an either or. Um, well, it is kind of either or. But it, as a data scientist, or it's a, it depends on the situation. Basically, for my rule of thumb for me is if I can load it in my RAM, I'm going to use pandas, mostly because I'm really bad at SQL and I'm a lot better at pandas. But also, you'll see it just simplifies a lot of code. And I actually before this talk tonight, I researched a bunch like which one should you use, when to use this versus that. I never really thought about this much since I don't do SQL that much. Um, and a lot of people, a lot of old hats said, uh, you know, the youngsters these days don't know how good SQL is and they don't understand and you can do so much in it. And then they're more moderate in the middle. People said, look, SQL is amazing. It can do a lot of really the same things, but it's a lot 
more cumbersome to write those queries in SQL than it is to write it in Pandas, which Pandas is very Pythonic. Now, that being said, there are some obvious limitations. Pandas, when it works, when I load a data set up, it's in my RAM, which means it has to fit. Um, SQL runs on your hard drive, not your RAM. So you can have 100 GB uh, a database and you can perform queries on it and you don't have to move the data anywhere. You do it on the database. So that's going to be way faster than trying to load it into your RAM if you even had 100 GB RAM, which most people don't. So it's good for tabular data. A lot of people and a lot of businesses have, a, there's a lot of people who work in Excel and they should be working at Pandas is what it comes down to. And once you start writing functions in Excel and you're like, oh, I'll try this, I'll try that. You basically, there's a lot of people who are slowly learning, okay, I need to be actually learning a little programming. And Pandas is the library to, to do that basically, all kind of tabular uh, manipulation. So that's it about um, uh, the difference. Uh, now, the question is, is it fast? Is Pandas fast? Yes, the answer is it's extremely fast. It's actually really cool how they've done it, how they made it so fast. But basically it just uses really clever math using algorithms from the 1950s and 60s and 70s. And like the libraries that it relies on are the stack is so deep for the math and the algorithms, that, but it goes really fast. And we'll talk a little bit, of, I'll show you some examples about where it's fast and where it's not fast. And there are certain you know, uh, optimizations you can do to make it faster, but for general use case, it's, it's really fast enough. Okay, so that being said, uh, let's look at it. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna load some basic, uh, I'm gonna load up a data set, and then I'm gonna show you how to just do stuff on the data set. What would I do if I just loaded this data? So the first thing is I'm actually importing not just pandas, you'll see I'm importing NumPy. Now NumPy is the, um, the main, data type that pandas builds on and I'll, I'll show you how it all works but i'm actually not going to use numpy much in this notebook but a little bit we're going to try to stay only in pandas and then from scikit-learn i'm using that just to get this data set which is this california housing data set so we're going to load it up and i'm just printing out the description of this data set to walk you through it it is um it's a data set of uh, homes in california they got this from the census i think in the California census for the United States census, there's 20,000 instances. Now they're not 20,000 homes. Each instance is actually like a block of homes. So like the people reported in groups and each instance is like a, like a block from the, um, from the group. So it's not one home per se. Um, and the goal of this data set is you're trying to predict uh, the median house value for the district. It's a district basically. And that target variable is expressed in hundreds of thousands of dollars. So there is a target variable. The idea is, you know, given these input variables, the medium income, the housing, the age of the home, and it's all by block group, right? So it's the medium income for that district, the, the age of the house for that area, the average number of rooms per house, the average number of bedrooms, the population of the block group, the average number of household members, and then the latitude and longitude. So where is it in the in the state, basically, given these things, can we predict the you know the price of the home? That's the machine learning task or the data science task that people often do with this. But we're just going to explore this, um, just because it's a, it's big enough that you can't sift through it by hand. It's twenty thousand instances, twenty thousand rows, and it's small enough that you can still fit most of the columns on the screen. There's only eight columns. Um, there are some data sets, you know, 500 columns. You can't look at it anywhere. There's no way you can look at it. You can't. It just takes forever to do anything. Not, not, sorry, let me rephrase that. When you're doing the original analysis and you're trying to understand each variable, it takes a long time because you have to read through 800 or 400 variables. Here, there's only eight and they're all pretty self-explanatory and we can all connect to homes, I think. Okay, so I'm not gonna read all of this. Oh, it's all just, it's from the 1990 census. So it's a little older. So um, that's why it's in hundreds of thousands, not millions, <laughs> whatever it would be now for California. And uh, we're just going to load it up. Ouch. Yeah. Ouch. Well, I'm don't, sure don't it's 1990. Me. Yeah. Yeah. Don't, don't remind you, right? Yeah. Okay. So here we are. We're going to take the array. So I'm making an array variable and I'm just showing you what this thing is. So this is the raw data. The raw data, I took it from this housing thing. This is, I'm not going to explain what this is, but this fellow is a NumPy array. So if we actually look at the data type of this thing, uh, type of data array, that is a NumPy array. And 
this is the data type. This was built by a different person for a different set of things. And, and when Wes McKinney made Pandas, he, he took this as the center. This is the, it's a matrix really. So this NumPy array, you can't really see it here because there's three dots here. Um, and each, so each one of this is one, two, three, and then it skips some, four, five, six. So it's only showing you six values of the columns and it skips some. And then in here, it's a bunch of things and it skips some too. So it's very hard to interpret this just looking at it. But if you look at the shape um, data array and you can do a shape, it's an attribute of all NumPy arrays. It says that it has 20,000 rows and eight columns. By the way, is this um, big enough? I'm on a 20 inch monitor. I, I don't know if I should make it bigger. Is that better for people on lot smaller laptops? Is it too big no. now? Uh, too, it, is that, that better? Looks good. Yeah, this is good. Okay. It was good yeah. before, but this so, is better. Okay, good. So, so we're at 20,000 uh, rows and eight, eight columns. But as you can see, an umpire array, while it holds all the information, it does. This is all the information. We don't have any visual indicators. So like I could look at maybe, um, you can slice these arrays. I can look at like the first five rows. And this is the first five rows. And it prints out in this scientific notation. That's the first row. And so this 8.325 is something, I don't know what, this 4.1, some, in, and this weird scientific notation. It's very science, um, these NumPy arrays. Now, the NumPy arrays are amazing because they're really, really optimized. And when you do operations on them, it goes incredibly fast. But for interacting with it, you can see clearly it's, it's not that great. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna make a data frame and that's where Pandas comes in. So we make, uh, this is the basic initialization routine. You have a data frame. It's PD, that's pandas, dot data frame. This is the main data type that you're going to be always making with pandas, data frames, data frames. This comes from R. I think in R programming, they have data frames too. Uh, and then we're going to put that data array, which is this thing, as the values. So I'm going to do a shift tab here in the Jupyter Notebook. This is just a, a trick. I don't know if you're familiar with Jupyter Notebooks or not. If I shift tab, it gives me the documentation. So it tells me I need, this is all in the doc string. So I need data. So my data is gonna be my data array. And then I have some options. I'm not gonna set the index. I don't need to, I'll let it default, but I'm gonna set the columns. And I wanna give it the names of the columns. And so I know, just cause I know when I, I know this housing thing, I just know about this fellow. This is, um oh. Yeah, this is a dictionary-ish. Um, and I know that it's feature names. I, I just know this from researching it earlier that it has these keys and that um, I want the feature names and the feature names are gonna correspond to, so housing dot feature names. This is just a list of a string list. So I'm just passing a string list over here. This housing feature names is just a list of strings. So I'm passing, on the on the a data part, I'm passing this raw array. And for the columns, I'm passing a list of strings. And then it creates for me a data frame that I'm going to call DF for data frame. I chose, normally I don't call my things DF. I call it like, uh, well, I call it all kinds of different things, but not normally DF. But I use DF today because you'll see lots of um, examples online when you're looking at Pandas documentation or uh, Stack Overflow examples. People use DF everywhere. So I thought I would just follow that. So I have a data frame, like yay, right? So I can just print it out, I guess. That looks better, right? Doesn't that look like this This looks reasonable, like comparing this to this, which I can't understand. This is, you know, first of all, they have this nice uh, and you alternating colors so you can see the rows very easily. You've got the column names at the top here, so you know what each thing is. And you got the index, which is auto-generated for me on the left side. And then, yeah, there are this dot, 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 because it's 20,640 rows, it can't show me all of that. I mean, it could, I, I wouldn't want it to show me all of that. So it automatically truncates it and I have eight columns. So that's my data frame. Now, like now what, right? So what I normally do is I run these commands. These are like my first things I'll always run when I'm gonna start, um, looking at some data. So the first thing is df head. Head just shows you the first five rows by default, which in this case, actually, you know, it's kind of like this, not that different. The reason I run this is just like a sanity check. Did it work? <laughs> Did it work how I thought it would work? Does it look right? Do, do these numbers house age 
seem like they're house age numbers or do they not? Now this only, you can only do this kind of sanity check if you can fit all your columns on the screen. Like I, like I said, I have a data set with 400 columns. I can't do this kind of sanity check. Um, I can look, you can slice into it and I'll show you how to do all that. But I probably wouldn't sanity check 387 columns one by one. I, I probably would just trust that it's it's been prepared correctly. Or I, if I didn't trust it was prepared correctly, then yeah, I would have to go through it by hand. But um, in this case, you can just sanity check it. The longitudes and latitudes look like they're, they're in the right range. Average occupancy looks like it's in the, you know, two, two, that makes sense, right? Not that many people. Population is per block, that makes sense. Number of bedrooms makes sense. This all looks about right. Um, medium income, 8.3 seems like not a real number. I mean, seven, who makes 7.2? That must be, there must be a representation for that. So maybe when I look at this, I'm gonna go find out what does this variable mean? So I'll go back up to my text and I'll try to find out, well, medium income in a block group, they don't tell me, but um, they did say somewhere, I remember reading it before that it's represented, oh yeah, the target variable is the median house value expressed in thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars. So I would just guess that the medium income per block is also in hundreds of thousands of dollars. So I would guess that this uh, 8.3 is probably $830,000 is the income for that area. Now, what we don't have here is the price. The price is missing. And the reason the price is missing, the price of the home is because just in machine learning land, you always keep your target variable separate from your data. But in this case, well, I don't want them separate. I want them together. So I'm going to make a new column. I'm going to call it price. And I'm going to set it equal to housing.target. Target is my target variable. And that's it. I'm This is the syntax. I'm creating a new column and I'm populating it with this thing. And the way the data is stored, this housing.target, if we look at it, it's a bunch of numbers. And the first number matches the first row. The index of this thing matches exactly to the index of uh, housing dot, whatever the other thing was called, uh, date, whatever I used to make data array. So I'm just gonna run that, and then I'm gonna run my DF again. And there it is, there's the price. Now we just added the price. So you just saw how to assign um, new columns to your data frame. Basically, uh, I'll show you all the slicing and indexing in a little bit, but you, index by the key. These are keys. This price is a key. And it, when you use the slicing notation on a data frame with a string, it tries to find it in the key in the columns. And if it finds it, it it's going to take that column for you. And then I assigned it the value of this array. So then it just stuck that in there. Now, you don't have to you know, put the array. You can do something weird like three. And that's actually going to make every single value three. So now every single value of price is three. So this is, um, that's a little, it might be a little strange. You might be like, wait a minute, why are all of them three, not just the first one or something? But this is called broadcasting uh, in, in NumPy. And I'm not gonna go into this now, but basically it, it's making a bunch of assumptions that if I'm trying to put three into a column, I want three in the entire column. It's just sort of an assumption that it's making. If I said, if I tried to give it something else, like a list of, I'll break it for you now, because it's important to understand. If I said three comma four, this is gonna throw an error. Uh, it gives me this error and it'll say length of two values does not match length index of 20,000, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a question I just saw, are data frames generally just dictionaries? You can create them from dictionaries. They are not, always though, but you can create them. So I'll, I'll show you that right now. It's really easy to do that. Let's make a dictionary. Um, we're gonna set it equal to, we'll have A and it'll be equal to uh, a list, one, two, three, and then B, and that can be another list, um, two, three, four, and that's my dictionary. And I can do uh, DF1 now or DF2, I guess. And we'll go with DF1 is fine equal to PD data frame, and you can just put my dict in there, and it will just work just like that. So you can you can do them as dictionaries where there's key value pairs where the key is here. The key here is the column. That's my column name, and the value is my list. Those are the values. So um, one, two, three is the column there. You see that? And then for the second one, B, 
it's two, three, four. This is a one way to do a rate creation routine. Most of the time when I use a data frame, I'm loading a CSV file or I'm getting some other, somebody, I'm downloading it from the internet. Like this time I used this, uh, this, this special function um, to get the data, downloaded it for me. Uh, fetch, this fetch function that does some wget or whatever. Uh, so, but normally I'm loading from a CSV file. You can load, but pandas, just so you can see, um, show you pandas from uh, array, let's see, from CSV. Because there's actually, you can you can read in from the documentation where they show us. Yeah, yeah. so you can have, here's the input output. I want to show you the left side really. Um, can I just show you the whole input output? Yeah, you can read from pickle. You can read from flat file, from table, from CSV. You can send to CSV. You can take it from the clipboard if you want. I didn't know that. You can take it from Excel. You can take it from JSON. You can take it from HTML, XML, uh, from LaTeX. That's new to me, I didn't know that. You can do from HDF5, which I believe is a serialization of some sort. I'm not real too clear on what that is. Um, from Feather, from, oh, I don't know how to pronounce this one, Park, 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 what? I think someone did something recently on this, right? Okay. ORC, SAS, SPSS, SQL, you can go from SQL, Google BigQuery, Stata, which is a big famous um, uh, statistics library thing. So these are all the things that you can go in and out from. And these are the, just the ones that are like super supported. I'm sure other people have hacked many more a thing than this. So yeah, you can, it, it's got a pretty good IO and you can use it kind of in and out of wherever you want. And dictionaries is one way, not um, necessarily like, right or wrong, just one way you can do it. So what I was gonna show you here is this doesn't work, right? It says, hey, you can't do that, two doesn't match. But if I give it just one value, it, it just makes this assumption for me that I wanted that value everywhere. Now, I actually wanted the price there, so I'm gonna put that back. Um, oh, sorry, housing.target. Okay, so I do my DF head to check, now it has my price. I do shape. Shape is really important because it tells you the dimensions. And you just kind of have to memorize this. Um, maybe I'll put it in a markdown cell for you guys. So it always goes rows, columns. That's just the way it always is. So it's 20,000 rows, nine columns. And this is just how shape always is for a, a pandas data frame. And, and you can think, um, if you know matrices, it's M by N, if you don't that kind of math stuff. So it always goes in rows and columns. So I always look at this, why? Because normally I have some kind of expectation about what it should be. If I'm loading in a CSV file or if I'm loading in this or that, I, I don't know, also just to know how many columns does this thing have? How many rows does it have? This is, the, this is just the fastest way for me to always check what's, what's, what is this thing? How big is this thing? Now, that being said, there are some more clear things like this one, info is really nice. So info tells you, can't quite get it all on. Info tells you um, some very nice info. So it says that it has a range index, which is just saying that, whatever, we'll ignore that for now. It has nine columns. And here's what's cool is it tells you about the columns. So it tells you two really important things. One is that it's uh, the non-null count. So if there's a missing value, it's gonna show up here, not like how many are missing, but it'll say like, if I had missing values in the income, it would say like 20,000. You know, that would mean that 640 are missing because I know that I actually have 20,640 rows. So if any one of these numbers is less than that number, some are missing. The other thing I wanted to point out is it has a D type. This is a data type. So normally in Python, for those of you who learned your first programming language in Python, we don't care too much for data types. <laughs> we just do whatever we want. And we have lists and dictionaries and that's it. Um, if you come from Java background, then this is more obvious, you know, data types are important, static, static languages are declaring them nonstop. Um, data bases declare a data type per column and pandas does that too. And they've created a number of uh, specific data types like float 64 that don't actually exist in Python natively, but NumPy has them. So NumPy has included like int, long, all the, all the more um, size, you know, different size numbers that you might want. And why is for performance reasons. So pandas will automatically try to assign the correct 
um, the best possible uh, data type, you don't have to manually do it. You're welcome to manually do it and you're welcome to downcast them or upcast them or change them and all of that kind of stuff, but you don't have to do it. Um, when you're data cleaning, a lot of times you might get a bunch of object stuff because it's strings or whatever, and you have to convert it from strings to integers or strings to floats because the input data was was typed. Nobody, and you have to convert it yourself. So sometimes you're doing a lot of that and Pandas supports all of that. This is just very important to know that every column has a data type and they need not all be the same, just in this case they are. Okay, so, and then, that's, that's important. Other thing is it tells you the memory usage, which is just nice. So this is pretty small, only 1.4 megabytes, no big deal. Um, larger, you know, larger data sets can start eating up your RAM and it's good to know what you're doing. So this is another really nice function that it has built in called describe. And this is probably like the first true uh, data analysis part. And what it's doing is just calculating a whole bunch of um, statistics on your behalf for you. Uh, it tells you how many exist, no big deal. It tells you the average value. It tells you the standard deviation for that medium income. So the average income in this, the mean income in this data set is 3.87, which means $387,000, um, which seems pretty high, right? But if you, so then, then you look at the standard deviation, but it can go in either direction by one standard deviation is $190,000 in either direction. But then if you look at the smallest one is 50,000, that seems a little high too, to be frank. I, I would expect the smallest income to be less than 50,000 uh, US dollars. And the maximum income is, um, you know, whatever 15 is, 15 times 100,000, I guess that's uh, 15 million or is that, someone else can do the math for me. One, but, 1 but you can. 1.5 mil, that seems low, right? So this whole thing, does maybe I, maybe I got the income variable wrong. Maybe it's not in hundreds of thousands. But clearly though, the the, the data set is a little skewed. And what, what right away, when I look at this, I want to actually ask myself, because this max, the maximum value is 15. And this, this percentile means at the 75th percentile, if we're counting the first 25% of people, if I order it, they're between 0.5 and 2.5. And the next 25 are between 2.5 and 3.5. It only goes up one. And then it goes up one more, basically. And then it goes from 4.7 up to 15. So what I would do right off the bat, if I was looking at this, is I would plot the distribution. I would plot this as a histogram. So you can do that super easily in Pandas. So you can actually select a column like this, med. Um, ink, it's capital I, I think. And I'll just do that first so we can see the column. So you, just so you see, I selected the column and um, that's what it does, it selected the column. Now I wanna actually plot from this. So Pandas has plotting built in. You can actually just do P plot and I'm gonna shift tab and you'll see there's a documentation for it and it tells you what you need. So I need to give it data. And then I have to tell it what kind of plot and this is a string argument and I want a histogram so I'm going to, and I want the data, well, the data is this one. So it's gonna be inferred actually, um, this plot, because this is from, yeah, you'll see it, it's just like magic. All I have to do is say kind is equal to hist, and it should plot me a histogram of, there it is, there's the histogram of the income. Now, this is not that pretty, so normally I like to make it a little prettier. I'll adjust the fig size, fig size. I'll make it a little wider, like uh, 12 comma six. So, well, you'll see what it does. 12 is the width and five is the height. So I'm just gonna stretch it out a little bit. Nope, didn't like, uh, it's cause this is an equal size. So that's forgot the equal, this is a keyword argument. So it stretches it out a little bit. And, and the other thing is I might wanna increase the fidelity on this. Well, first of all, we can already see, hey, look, this thing is pretty skewed, right? What did I say? Like up to the 75th percent is 4.7. So that's over here. So 75% of the people are all left. So you can see there's not that many people out here. This is very, very, these are your outliers, right? So you can already see, yeah, this makes sense now. Most of the people are around here with their income and some of them are over here and those are probably our outliers. One thing you can do is you can control the bins, which is how many little blocks it makes. And I can put like, uh, I don't know what the default is, but I'm gonna put a lot. And so now we have 200 bins. So now you can see that fidelity has increased a lot more. So you can see it a lot more clearly. You can see even within this distribution over here, there's little little spikies that are sticking up. So there's little mini, mini distributions within the distributions. Maybe that's too much. I'll smooth it out to like 100. 
that still looks a little funny to me. I would probably go for like, yeah, that looks better. That's kind of my distribution. Okay, so I'm already learning something about my data. What did I learn? I learned that in the income, uh, most people are in this area and I've got a bunch of outliers. Now, depending on the task I wanna do with this, I might make some decisions, but right now I'm just exploring. Now, turns out pandas can do something even cooler for us. Um, I don't even have to select this one. I can just do df.hist and just run it. And it just makes, well, this tiny little thing you can't see. So I do have to do one thing. I have to do fig size equals, I have to make it a little wider. So I'm gonna do 20 comma 10. And then I can see it pretty well. And actually see all this, that drives me nuts. This is the one time in Python I use semicolons. It suppresses that output. So now it just makes that go away. So this is pretty cool. I just ran one command, hist, on my data frame, and it automatically plotted the histograms for all my variables, including the price. Uh, question, so pretty what neat. happens for data that's not numerical? Yeah, I think it just ignores it automatically. Um, we could make some and stick it in there and find out not numerical. Let's do, uh, how would I do that? What would happen if we just, all right, we're gonna try it. If it fails like terribly, I'm not gonna pursue it, but I'll, but I'll get back to you. I promise you that. Okay, we'll call it non, we'll just call this df string and we're gonna put into it, hello. <laughs> I don't know if this is gonna work how I think it's gonna work. Yeah, it did. Okay, there we go. Now I have hello everywhere. And now let's call my hist on that and it just happily ignores it because pandas is super smart. <laughs> cool, right? Nice. Yeah, this is like, it's nice when uh, people are just make stuff easy to use. So now, of course, this works when you have nine variables. Again, if you have 387, this ain't going to work. You're going to have to select the ones you want, or it will work, and your computer will just crawl to a stop while it's trying to process all the stuff and, and do who knows what. But when the data is still pretty small, because we're only at 1.4 MB, this isn't a hard to do and it, and it comes out real nice. Any other questions? That's a very good question. So I've got, I've got a couple, but I'll, I'll hold yeah. them for now. This is good. This is great. I mean, nice okay. work. So from a, from a data science perspective, looking at this, just from the analytic part, I noticed that these, this distribution makes sense to me, medium income, house age makes sense to me. I mean, I, the distribution itself looks like a distribution. Let me say it like that. But average rooms, average occupancy, population, and average bedrooms, not any one of these looks like a distribution. It looks like everybody has one thing. And that doesn't make any sense to, me, to my mind. And I've learned through experience that the reason is that there's a lot of outliers. There's a ton of outliers. And you can kind of see them poking their heads up here along the, along the x-axis, but not really. And so what I would do with this, for example, if I really wanted to understand the average bedrooms, is I would then drill down on that. And I'll just show you a little bit how I would do that. Um, I would take average bedrooms. And yeah, it, but isn't that cool? It gives you autocomplete even on the strings. I don't know how it does that. Um, but it does, which I think is just great. <laughs> so I'm going to drill down on this, and I'm going to uh, I'm going to plot with a histogram. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to control the uh, I'm going to zoom in on it. So I'm going to do bins equal to whatever 50, and this isn't going to this isn't going to still give me what I want really because it still looks like that. Um, but I will control the fig size. I'm going to make it just a little bit wider. I always forget that that's an equal sign for whatever reason. Okay, well, that's maybe a little too wide. Let's go with uh, 6, 15, 10. Maybe a little too deep, too. Okay, sorry. Let me just. Okay, that looks better. We can see that on the screen. Okay, this still isn't there. And what I need to do is I need to set the X limit, is what I need to do. I need to limit myself to like um, probably like five. And then I need to, well, it depends. If I want to zoom in on the outliers, I have to control the Y. So I slice down. So let's start with that. And the way you do that, um, I don't actually know. Can I set X limb in this? Um, so these are all the, I'm just looking through all the options. Mm, log X, Y, X, ah, X limb. There we go. X limb and Y limb. It's a two tuple list. Set the X limits of the current axis. Okay, so there we go. 
So x lim is equal to, I'm gonna, I'm gonna zoom in on the, I'm gonna cut the outliers out right now is what I'm gonna do. Equal to, and I'll go from zero to five, five. And I think I need one more, that, yeah. There it is. Now I've zoomed in on this. Now, even with 50 bins, it doesn't look very good. And I'm assuming that's because those bins are being applied you know, to the stuff we can't see. So I'm just gonna bump that number up to 200 and hope that we get some fidelity in here. So look, even in here, you can see, well, this is bedrooms, right? So most people really only have one bedroom basically in their home. And I don't even know how it'd be less than one bedroom. I think it's still histogramming. So it's still uh, 2000 might break my computer. Let's find out. I see, you just never know when one number is too much. Okay, yeah, there's a really nice histogram around one. So most people have one and even here, these are outliers. But yeah, so that, that shows you basically, I guess that most people really just have one. Uh, I don't know how anyone, oh, cause these are all blocks, right? So each block, they're all in, they're all in fractions. So we don't actually have, we have averages of each block. So it's like 1.2, 1.3, 1.1, but most people have one bedroom in this data set. That's what it's telling us. Now, well, let's go back to this, but let's instead change the Y limb to between zero and, I don't know, a hundred. So now I'm gonna zoom the other way. So now I'm trying to zoom in on these outliers and see how many people have 30, 35 bedrooms in their house, right? It's probably one, right? So even, even between zero and a hundred doesn't make sense. This is how many people have that or how many blocks have that. So I'm gonna go between zero and 20 on my Y limb. And of course you could set both the X limb and the Y limb. It's all your choice. Now I'm in here, I can see, okay, 2.5. So this is like probably one one block has 25 bedrooms, which is a, it's a major outlier, obviously. So that's just something that I always do whenever I see a histogram that shows me this, I'm gonna zoom in on it. Okay, so that's a little bit of visualization stuff. I, um, the next thing I was gonna move to is like selecting and not kind of like the, um, how do you select all the bedroom, all the rows that are more than 10 or more or less than this. So if anyone has questions about the visualization part, now is a good time to ask. Oh, actually, I wanna show you one other really cool thing I did at the bottom that I didn't do up here yet. This one is, we're gonna, I'm gonna copy paste this. So here I'm gonna plot a, no, I want this one, yeah, yeah. I'll just run it down here. This is a scatter plot. No, what don't you like? Uh, oh yeah, I, I made it uppercase now. No, I still don't like something. Oh, what did I do to offend you? Um, Was it called target instead of price? There could be a lot of different things if it changed. No, it's not oh. called target. It's the color. It's a color map. Now it's there. So this is um, a scatter plot. And with a scatter plot, you plot like uh, little points, like X and Y points. So I'm plotting the latitude and the longitude. I hope I did that right. Does latitude go up and down? Well, it looks like California, right? Let me make it smaller. Um, well, I can just shrink the screen a little bit, I think. So this is a, um, it's still too big, huh? Okay, hold on. Let's make this um, 12. Okay. Let's make it 10. This is a plot, which is a scatter plot of the latitude and longitude and the points. And you can see it looks kind of like California. And what I did, I added to it was I added the color bar is true. That gives us this thing on the right side. And the C map is just a color pattern. And then C, this C is the colors. What colors do I want to plot the dots? And I told it to plot the dots according to price. So basically what we're seeing is the, the dark purple homes, the dark purple points, these are just latitude and longitude of these groups. The dark purple ones are the highly expensive ones and the light light uh, colored ones are the, the less expensive ones. And if you know California geography, you can probably pick out, this is probably Los Angeles. This is probably the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area on the coast, right? And then this is like um, Carmel and Santa Cruz or whatever. And I actually don't know what's over here. I don't know what's really expensive over there. There's something very expensive over there. Paul and then you see Springs. the the... Is that what it is? Okay. Could be, yeah, Palm Springs, Joshua Tree. I have no idea. Um, but, and also this is maybe incomplete data too. But uh, but yeah, so this is just cool, right? Isn't that just fun? 
and you're getting a map of California just by looking at these longitude and latitude points. And from a data science perspective, if you're trying to predict something, well, you just certainly learned something very important, right? <laughs> If it's close to the water, it has a very good chance of being expensive, right? <laughs> and now realtors probably already know this. You don't need data science to tell you that. But it's still cool to see how these kind of visualizations can play out and, and teach you a lot and how easy it is to do it. You just, I'm saying my X is my latitude, my Y is my longitude, I'm doing a scatter plot, I'm setting my size, I'm giving me a color bar. You can change this thing. There's a lot of other ones. Another one I like is called Beardus. Um, it's this yellow and blue one, so the yellow is brighter. There's actually a whole science to these things, to the even spectrum for the eyes and stuff like that. And then this C, this one I had to look up today. That's just what color, it's a it's a weirdly, it's a badly named variable um, keyword argument, but it's just what color do you want to color the dots? And I'm going to color them according to the price, and it automatically does this gradient because of the color map that I applied to the price. Okay, so questions about visualizations or anything like that i think i'm already out of time aren't i yeah we're well um the presentation <laughs> has been so great and this is honestly so interesting i think that uh at least for myself i, I don't want to get in your way but we do we are at around the 15 minute mark left um and we could take a pause here and people can really feel free to uh ask yeah. any questions you know one i have is is do you ever are you always using pandas inside a, a like a notebook, Jupyter notebook or otherwise, or is this something I, you use in kind of a more both. State, Python application? No, it's it's in both. I use it in both. Um, okay. Exploratory data analysis, which is basically what I was doing today, is I always do in a notebook because I can shift enter. I can get my plots right here. If you don't do it in a notebook, it pops up as a window, which mm -hmm. is then you have to click the X to close the window. Um, and yeah, but I use Pandas in a number of classes that I've written for experiments, for machine learning. Uh, we use it a lot, but it tends to be that um, when you get into the hardcore, more machine learning, like uh, training, fitting, predicting, you don't need Pandas. You just need the data inside of Pandas. Mm -hmm. And that's just the NumPy arrays. So you, when you, you're just operating on the arrays directly. Pandas is my experience really more useful for the data analysis part, the exploratory, which is a huge part of it and the, the cleaning of it. I, and I find that the cleaning works real well in the notebook because you can check each thing as you go. You know, I can constantly look, did it do what I thought it did? Did I just, did I, did I actually merge on that thing? I can slice in and look, okay, that's what I got back is that I can do sanity checks. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's obviously really interesting and useful you know I, I in my mind i'm also thinking about for instance if you exported that housing data set as a csv file it would just be this huge file of random numbers separated by commas mm -hmm. you know? yeah and very very quickly using pandas you can slice it and dice it and visualize it and um yeah. you know as soon as that map popped up i was like oh it's california <laughs> yeah so, exactly um dennis just asks um do we provide replays? Yes. Replays. So then, yeah, Dennis, yeah. if you're, we, yeah. we will, we, this is being recorded. We will share it. Also, we will share the, um, this notebook, if you don't mind, Gilad, we'll, we'll, yeah. we'll, post it yes. up to, we'll put it on GitHub. Yeah. There's a code yeah. of has a tech talks repo on our GitHub. I'll share the link right here. Um, and we, we will be sharing that with everybody so that you can play around with this as well. One, and for somebody who's just getting started with Jupyter notebooks. Um, what's like? Let's say they. This is going to be the first time they they run a notebook and pandas yep. and play with this. Like, where yep. do they start with notebook? Well, if you're already using VS Code, you can actually just open this up in VS Code. You don't need to okay. open. You don't need to install Jupyter Lab. It has its own interface. It looks a little different. Um, so that's one thing. You don't have to. It'll look a little different uh, in VS Code, but it's the same thing. I'm used to this one, so I just use it. It's kind of a habit at this point. Basically, the what you need to know about notebooks is that it's it's the exact same thing as a here. Let me get an interpreter open. Yeah, come on. I hid my task manager, and now doesn't want to come back. I mean, my sidebar thing. My uh, here. I'll, here's a okay. So if you're in a um, IPython session or a Python session, uh, you this is an interpreter session and. Most of all our students, I think we know how to do this interpreter terminal, all this kind of stuff. Notebook is just this. 
That's all it is. Mm -hmm. This is a live Python interpreter running. So in the notebook, what's happening is you're just interacting with that live interpreter. So that's what it says right here. It says the Python 3 kernel, IPython kernel is running. And right now it tells me down here it's idle. And when I'm making it do something, it won't be idle. So here, I'll make it do something that I know it'll take it a little while. Um, this one takes a little while. I'm going to plot a heat map. No, this one's pretty fast, actually. Um, oh, but I don't have cores, though. Yeah, okay. So when it's running, this 52 should turn into a star. And then it makes, this is a correlation plot. This is another one that's really cool. So this makes the, sorry, I hit the mic. This DF correlation, it just automatically does the stats for the correlation between um, correlation, you know, the relationship between the variables. And then I just uh, took a little, the code's not that complicated, actually. I can walk, I could walk you through it, but we don't have time. Um, and to make a heat map of that to show the correlation similar to the other heat map we saw. So here where there's a very dark number, eight, that means these variables are very correlated. So average bedroom and average rooms has 0.85 correlation, which makes total sense that if you have more rooms, you have more bedrooms. Also um, latitude and, lo and longitude are negatively correlated. I didn't really figure that one out yet. And then price and medium income are correlated, which also makes sense. Um, so, but the thing that you know about notebooks is that these cells can run out of order. That's the main thing. So every time you're in a cell, you're shift entering, you're executing it, shift enter executes this thing, and it gives you the output right away just like a Python interpreter. Now, the tricky thing about notebooks is you can totally run them out of order. So I just did that, right? I tried to run this and it didn't work because I hadn't run this one yet. And once I ran this one, then I can run this one. Now, and the numbers are gonna see, this is 57 and this is 56. So people, this happens to everybody. You start you know, jumping up and down and taking this from there and running that there. And suddenly something doesn't work anymore because you rewrote the variable name basically. And so, that's the danger of notebooks is they get messy fast. And then you can always do this restart and clear all outputs. You can do that as provided you weren't doing some long running process. You don't want to lose the memory of that thing that will erase the Python kernel and start it fresh. So it'll clear out all the variables. Um, the last thing to know about notebooks is it's called Jupyter. So it's Julia, Python, and R. So you can connect them to not just a Python kernel, but if I had other kernels, I could connect to an R kernel um, it's another programming language, or Julia, which is another programming language. So this is the long-running project. It started off as IPython notebooks, then it got turned into Jupyter notebooks, which stands for Julia, Python, and R. And you can, but you, I've seen other people run, I think you can run Kotlin in notebooks. Um, I think you can run all kinds of stuff. Any, any interpreted language that has a live interpreter can basically be run in a notebook. And uh, this whole framework is... Um, there's also the other things people really like is this uh, writing. You can do the um, the markdown. This is markdown, right? So I can just shift execute markdown and it makes it nice so that you can uh, document and, and make it like books. People have written books and notebooks, coding books and stuff. So. Okay. And this this application, um, Jupyter Lab, uh, Jupyter Lab. This yeah, is a, that's that this one, Jupyter Lab. For instance, that you can Google, download and install it on your machine. And yes, open yeah. this notebook. Yep. Got it. Yeah, very nice. Yep. The easiest way to get started, if you if you want to get started, is actually, and you don't have any idea about any of this stuff, is to go to anaconda.com. Anaconda, especially if you're on Windows or Mac, um, you can just download this thing, and it downloads, it installs more than you need, but most people have half a gig of space in the computer, anyways, and it it actually has everything like in a, a GUI interface, so you can click launch this, click launch that. It makes it super easy to install packages. You don't have to use the command line even. So for just getting started, I know Ryan's like squirming. He loves command line. <laughs> but for just getting started, for just getting started, this is the easiest way. You just download this thing, and it'll click. It has a launcher, and you can click launch, and it'll open up in a window, and everything is there for you. And if you already know some command line, you know how to install your own packages, then you just have to install um, uh, Jupyter. And that comes with Project Jupyter Home. And you just go here and follow their instructions and try it out. And they'll have, they have very good instructions for how to get started with it. And there's like hundreds of YouTube videos. Uh, we have a few on our platform as well. I mean, I have a few short ones where I teach everyone how to do it. I think it's even open in the data science machine learning courses before, the, before you have to sign up for it. It's one of the free ones. So yeah, everyone can get started really easily. The advantage of Jupyter Notebooks is the interactivity. You can really try things out and sanity check what you're doing. And for good coding practices, you should have VS Code or your favorite um, 
editor next to you. So as you're learning, okay, this worked, because what will happen is you'll get these really long, messy things. You basically, a refactoring process starts to happen where you're gonna wanna copy paste that snippet that actually works into your Python script or your Python program or your class. And I use Jupyter really as a playground is what I would recommend. Uh, I, I don't like long-term projects in Jupyter. The other, the other thing, the last thing to say about these things is they are, um, they are not Git friendly. So they all the way this works is this is like just full of JSON. All these um, notebooks are every time you make an output, it it saves that serialized in JSON. So if I commit this with the output to GitHub, and then I even change one thing in the notebook and commit that to the output to the out uh, to GitHub, it'll have like 50,000 lines changed or whatever, some enormous amount. So you can't really version control them very easily, which is another real problem with using this in like a real serious software development practice. This is a, a thorn in the side of many a machine learning person who wants to use them more, but can't because they don't really play well with version control. There's kinds of workarounds and hacks, but it's not great, basically. Yeah, makes sense. So we've got a few more minutes left here. Anybody else, uh, any other questions, oh, thoughts, yeah. comments that come to mind for anybody? Feel free. Any great visualizations I didn't show you guys. I have a bunch of stuff we didn't get to look at, but I think we look at the fun stuff. So this was just the median one. Oh yeah, this pairwise plot. That's another cool one. It has, you have all these libraries that have just built in this. I'll run this while hopefully someone will ask a question. No, SNS is not defined. Yeah, I imported that somewhere later on. Yeah, I imported it here. So Seaborn is something, oh, two, that's bad. It says two, that means I lost my kernel. That means nothing is here. Okay, I see now, <laughs> I don't know what happened. I lost everything somewhere. I must've restarted it. Uh -oh. okay, well, the, the wheels are falling off. The wheels are falling off. <laughs> oh, we can just go in and run it real quick again. Um, are there any questions from anyone? It looks like- Anything would be nice. It looks like you've done such a good job of uh, of explaining this and introducing this, or 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 nobody has any idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> well, uh, I have a question, question for you, Gilad. Oh yeah, go ahead. Yes, go ahead, please. Um, okay, well, I've been sort of getting into into pandas recently um, for a project, and I was sort of confused about the different ways to select data. So yeah, um, I didn't get. I that noticed. Part yet. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we can we can look at it here. That's the part we skipped. Um, I can keep going. Right, I yeah. have time if you want me to sh explain it quickly. But I think if we're gonna we want to end. That's gonna take me more than uh, three minutes to explain. Yeah, I mean, I basically I know that there's like, you know, the location indexer lock. Um, how do you pronounce mm -hmm. that, by yep. the way? Lock. In my head, I pronounce it. I pronounce it lock in my head, but I mean, that's like GIF and GIF. It's up to you, right? right? <laughs> um, yeah. Basically, um, what I saw was um, that they recommend that people were kind of recommending to me that I should always use loc um, over the other methods, the sort of uh, quicker methods of just using square bracket index indexing um, on the data frame directly. I don't know what your For, opinion is I on that. Performance reasons, I think you are supposed to use it that way. Um, but no, I do the square bracket indexing all the time. I have no issue with that. Um, they have they have a they have a little thing in their documentation about that. I can look it up and send you the link. But for performance, you are supposed to use dot loc. But I mean, we're talking about like real edge performance, right? So yeah. are, are you really doing super serious performance or not? I don't know. So the thing is, we'll just roll through this super fast. You have yeah. Go um, for it. Well, do do I have this? Yeah. So I can select a column by just doing a string and that gives me that column. I can also do this attribute thing. That's just like a dot attribute. I would not recommend this. I would recommend you not do because I've had issues with this. Um, this is just a synonym. It's just a syntax sugar, but I've had issues with it where when I tried to dot after it, I had some problems or something didn't quite work. So I've kind of banned this mentally. I don't use that version. I only do it with the, with the string and you get autocomplete anyways, so it's fine. Um, if you just do a normal slice, Python slice like this, it's gonna infer and give you the first 10 rows. It just automatically thinks I want the rows. That's just what it does. Now, once you want to go rows and columns, uh, well, before you even go rows and columns, you can select specific columns by just putting this the string of the column. Like I'm saying, I want I want these three I want these three columns, and that will give me just those three columns. 
Now, if I want to get the first 10 rows and those three columns, so I'm trying to do a comma here. I'm saying, here's my rows and here's my columns. And if you come from NumPy, this does work. This is how you index a matrix. You, you, the first part before the comma is the slice for the rows. The second part after the comma is the slice for the columns. So mentally, I, I thought this should work. Now it doesn't um, because it interprets it as, a, well, it just doesn't work. So and then you have to go to these ones. So you can do the exact same thing with dot loop. You can say, give me the first five rows and give me the uh, these three columns and it will just do that. So that is the first six rows actually. This is interesting uh, point um, is that with location, it includes the stopping criterion because technically, normally in Python, you never have that, right? It's zero to five, five not included. But with loc, five is included because it, technically it's not an integer. It's actually slicing this as a key value out of the index. So B or DF has an index and that index is this, this range index thing, but it's uh, some kind of generator. I'm not sure what it is, but it actually, when you do this, you're location-based indexing and you need to use keys and labels. And technically it is a key, zero to five. These are keys from this index. So it includes the stopping one. And I think their logic was when people are using labels, they want to include that. You can, interestingly enough, do something like, um, I can remember my columns. Let's just do df.head here. I can say, give me everything from medium ink up to average, well, up to population. I can put a colon in between this, which is kind of weird. Oh, I can't put a colon in between that. I'm totally wrong. I thought I could. Uh, I guess. Maybe without the brackets. Let me try one more time and then I'll give up. Uh, uh, yeah, see, you can. So you can slice even with these labels. So that's saying slice from here to here. So this is more flexible, basically. That's why I would use it. I wouldn't use it for performance reasons. I would use it because now you can slice both along the rows and along the columns. That's why I would use location. And then the other one- well, I think that's why is, it was recommended to me. There was like, this the the log is always going to work, and it's kind of the more specific and more flexible one. Yep. So if you're yep. going to learn one, yes, you're going to learn that one. Yeah, yeah, that's true. There's no reason not to learn. And then you just have to remember everything before the comma is for your rows, and everything after the comma is for your columns. And if you want specific columns, you have to put them in a list. If you want to slice on the columns, you have to put them um, without a list. So I can I can choose whichever columns I want specifically, and it'll do that like that. Now, integer location is the same thing, but you have to use in numbers. So I can do zero to five or zero, to, and this will be like normal Python slicing. And that will give me the first four rows and the first four columns. And it's just, it's just assigning a number to these columns automatically. So that's I is for the integer location. And you technically can even combine them with some workarounds, but you shouldn't. I mean, mostly you won't need to. So that, that is the, how you slice. Nice. Thanks. So, yeah. And the only thing we didn't get was Boolean indexing, but uh, that one can wait for another day. Okay. This well, is thanks, all, everybody. Yeah, this has been so great, Galad. Thank you so much. Um, yep. And and we've got a bunch of people over in the chat that have mentioned as well that this was very interesting and well done. It's it's just it's amazingly powerful and quick and easy to just slice and dice yep. and visualize this data. Yeah. And um, and. You know, the best way to get into this, I'm sure, as, as, I'm, as I'm sure you did, is just, just kind of start, right? Get in there, start poking around. Mm -hmm. Like you said, look at the tutorials. Yep. There's a million YouTube videos. We've got some stuff on yep. Coding Nomads platform where we, where we start to dive into it. Um, yeah, Monica is asking, how do I learn more? Yep. That would be my first recommendation. We will share this, uh, the link. Galad is going to share this notebook. We're going to post it up on Coding Nomads GitHub. We've also got a recording of this video, which we'll share with everybody as well, so you can refer back to it. But if you don't have uh, Anaconda or Jupyter Lab set up uh, and you want to start getting in there, uh, you, or as Galad said, you can do it right in VS Code. But yep. uh, get into get into Anaconda, get that installed, start playing around, start opening some notebooks, uh, yep. reading the documentation. And I would go through this. Yeah, this documentation is really good and easy to use. You can go right. through this 10 minutes of pandas and they have this. This is all really good. I mean, it's really, really yeah, good. And what to, they do is so great. Double that. The documentation is awesome. Nice. It's excellent. 
And every every single thing that they that they tell you how what it does, they actually for every single function they have examples with little itty bitty itty bitty like toy examples that you can play with and you can validate it yourself and you can make sure that it works. And you can even copy paste this stuff, I think, directly into your notebook and it works. I think. Let's just try it once real quick. Um, maybe not that. I don't want the output, but uh, no, you'd have to work on it a little bit. But you can still uh type it over and it works pretty well right so you can then immediately have oh, something broke but you get the idea yeah the beauty of live Data time index demos yeah yeah well great know, live that's why that's why i prepared okay thanks everybody thank you galad thank you all for joining we will share this with everybody and everybody please enjoy the rest of your day we'll be back in two weeks with another tech talk hope to see you there we'll send out emails on all fronts and uh, thank you again galad everybody enjoy the rest of your day yeah, thank you so much. Bye bye. That's amazing. Thanks, Caleb. Hey, everyone. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please let us know by liking and subscribing. If there's another topic that you'd like to learn more about, leave us a comment. We would love to hear from you. And if you want to become a coding pro, visit our website at codingnomads.co. See you next time.